So the scientists are rounded up and they're sent here to Castle Cranberg. Um, now the war is at its end. So we're now moving into May of 1945 and the military is in charge of this castle and it's called Dustbin as a nickname. And the scientists are set up there and they begin to be interrogated. And when I went to Germany and I went through a lot of the different Bundes archives, I was fascinated reading some of these original transcripts of these scientists. And these are sort of 70 page documents which show in a very subtle way how this program began. So you have these military intelligence officers learning about Hitler's nerve agent programs that we did not know about, learning about Hitler's biological weapons programs that we did not know about, interviewing the scientists and trying to find out all that we can, but also you see decisions being made. And that real decision comes down to this. Should this scientist be hanged or should this scientist be hired? Um, this here is Castle Cranberg. It was very interesting. The scientists were all walking around here. You had Speer out in the garden walking around to himself. You had Karl Brandt, Hitler's physician, leading gymnastics. Some of the scientists would give lectures. Um, and all the while, they're going in and out of these little rooms and being interrogated by these different American military officers. Underneath the castle, and remember this was Goring's, one of Goring's Luftwaffe headquarters during the war. Now we're in charge of it. And under the castle, there was this bunker, which was where Hitler planned to go with his inner circle in the event that the Reich made the decision to use nerve agents, to use sarin gas, which plays an important role in Operation Paperclip. And you know, why that nerve agent was never used remains one of the great mysteries of the war. We, Allied Intelligence, discovered these giant bunkers filled with bombs ready to be loaded onto Luftwaffe planes that contained sarin gas. But Hitler never gave the order. But he had Albert Speer design this bunker for him in the event that he did give the order, this is where they were going to hang out. So again, it was this great sort of mysterious irony that this is where the scientists were held who invented these nerve agents. These are some of the guys who were in Castle Cranberg, and we'll get to their stories in a moment. Meanwhile, you've got something else going on at Nordhausen, which is the rockets. And these officers that are there are realizing the the incredible breadth and scope of the rockets, the V-2 rockets that, that were there. And they had orders to gather a hundred of these rockets and to bring them back to the United States so that they could be launched out in uh, New Mexico. But then suddenly they come across not only the rocket, plural, but they come across the scientists. And this is Von Braun right after his, actually he wasn't captured, he surrendered he knew how important he would likely be to Allied intelligence, and he was right. Um, and also with Von Braun, who's sort of been left out of this story, is General Dornberger. He became an American hero, and you see him there in his leather coat, which he liked to wear because the Reichsfuhrer SS wore that same coat. Dornberger was Von Braun's boss, and he later became one of the most important players in Paperclip. He recruited for the Pentagon. He would fly back and forth to Germany looking for more German scientists. He had a top-secret clearance uh, into the middle 50s, and he was really a favorite um, uh, in the Washington inner circle. When I started reporting the program, this was one of the only photographs I could really find of the rocket scientists. Whoops, that's one. And then there you have, just so you can get an idea how quickly we brought these rockets over and the scientists, and there it is. Um, just a couple years after the war, the first v, the rocket, V-2 rocket, that's an actual V-2 rocket, um, carrying Albert, the first monkey astronaut. M Albert didn't survive. Back to the chemical weapons. So that sarin gas I was speaking of, this is Dr. Otto Ambrose. And I think 
if I would have to say one of the more nefarious elements of Operation Paperclip, and I, I'm not going to tell you all the narratives that are in the book, but I will tell you one briefly about Dr. Ambrose. And the reason why I think his story is just so horrific is that Ambrose was Hitler's favorite chemist. And I say that literally. He invented the sarin gas for the Reich, but he also invented synthetic rubber, which was extremely important because tanks need treads, aircraft need wheels, and the synthetic rubber that was produced was so important to Hitler that he awarded Ambrose here a one million Reichsmarks bonus, a document I found in the National Archives which had never been written about before. Uh, that's how important Ambrose was. And further, the Reich was building synthetic rubber at Auschwitz. So this here is a satellite photo from 1944, June, and you have Auschwitz-Birkenau and the gas chambers up there, but down in the lower corner here, you have a slave labor facility run by IG Farben, who is the chemical company that also produced Zyklon B, and they were making synthetic rubber down there, and Otto Ambrose, who would later become part of Paperclip, uh, was in charge of that facility. Of all the photographs that I came upon in researching this book, and we all know those you know, horrific photographs of the bodies as cordwood, nothing disturbed me more than this photograph. And that's because of what it says. It says, Company Sporting Club IG Auschwitz, up top. And those are two of Otto Ambrose's colleagues fencing as they would in the evening after a long day of what they thought was hard work at the laboratory there at Auschwitz. But as I n learned from colleagues, academics at the Fritz Bauer Institute who gave me permission to republish this photograph, um, this was well within the view of the chimneys at Auschwitz. So... Bloma is captured and he cooperates with Allied intelligence. He's the first high-ranking member of Hitler's inner circle that speaks of atrocities, mass sterilization, and gassing of Jews. He becomes a key player in this story because he's the first person who cooperated. But at the same time, you have Colonel Harry Armstrong, who is a top physician for what was then called the Army Air Forces, later the U.S. Air Force. And uh, Armstrong was on a mission in Berlin looking for Nazi doctors. He called them German physicians. And for many years, the, the idea, the fiction was that they were German physicians. But really, I and others before me have put together the very clear picture of what most of these men were doing during the war. And you see them here, their photograph, this photograph never been printed before. Um, this is 34 of the top leading physicians who worked in a classified program, one of the very first programs that was part of Operation Paperclip inside Germany, in Heidelberg, starting, you know, days after the war ended because the the Army Air Forces knew that to bring these men to the United States so quickly would, would never fly. And so they had them working there in Heidelberg. Later, 34 of them would uh, join Harry Armstrong at a facility in Texas. Hubertus Strughold, the father of space medicine, we'll get to a little more about him in a moment. But in the meantime, as all those doctors that I just showed you the photograph of were working at Heidelberg under Harry Armstrong, another element of military intelligence came knocking. And there, they had information that six of these doctors were wanted for war crimes. And so six of them went off to Nuremberg. These three would become part of paperclip, some before, some after. Um, this is Dr. Theodore Benziger. He was one of the ones that was taken away to Nuremberg. But what I was so, you know, really startled by was <clears throat> when I first read about Theodore Benziger, I read his obituary in the New York Times, which was published in 1999. 
and uh, it spoke, uh, it lauded his career for naval intelligence. Um, he was a physiologist for the Navy, and it talked about how he invented the ear thermometer and what great contributions he had given to military medicine, but it never mentioned his wartime work. And what I found in Berlin were documents that showed that Benziger was on the original list of criminals that were going to be tried at the Nazi, at the uh, doctor's trial at Nuremberg, but he was mysteriously released just a few weeks before the trial. He was turned over to custody of the U.S. Army Air Forces, and he was brought to America. That's the Nazi doctor's trial. You see Bloma in the middle. He was acquitted. He would later work for Paperclip. Dr. Beaglebach, I write about him uh, at length in the book. And one of the only surviving uh, witnesses to the uh, what went on in the concentration camps, Carl Hollenreiner. Um, amazing story, I think, in, in, in the book, very dramatic. It's amazing how these little nuggets are lost to history. When I was reading the trial transcripts, I discovered when Hollenreiner was put on the witness stand, um, because the doctor that you just saw removed a piece of his liver without anesthesia. They were trying to test uh, how long someone could survive in the ocean, a, a downed pilot, and how long, how much seawater you could drink. So they were simulating these tests written by the other doctors who would later come to Texas. Um, but Hollenreiner was so angry, he had a dagger hidden in his pocket, and he leapt off the witness stand, and he ran to the dock to try to stab Dr. Beaglebach. It's this incredible moment. I couldn't believe I had never heard of this before. And then the great tragedy of it was the judge, the American judge, who really believed firmly that we were at Nuremberg to show how democracy works, put Hollenreiter in the prison with the very doctors who had done this to him. Dr. Strughold was in charge of all the Nazi doctors that worked for the Luftwaffe. He became our father of space medicine, and there he is with a library that was named after him, which was ultimately taken down. Um, you know, the program went all the way up to the Pentagon, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff were in charge of the program. And when, you, when I would read over some of these documents, it was fascinating how you could really see the difference. You could see some of the military generals who were reporting to the Joint Chiefs were just pained at having to bring these individuals here to the United States to work on our weapons programs. But it was also kind of shocking to me that some of the generals did not feel that way at all. They actually respected and admired some of the Nazi scientists. And I was surprised to find that this was one of them, General Lukes, was in charge of the Chemical Corps. And I don't say this lightly, and I don't, um, I mean, it's very important that one has, as a journalist, one has the documents to back this up. The nerve agent program is still largely classified, but I traveled to the U.S. Army Military History Institute in Pennsylvania to look at General Lukes' papers, and it was there that I found these uh, personal diaries that he wrote, which told much of the story which I report in Paperclip. There you see Luke's at um, a party he's having, and it was in those papers that I discovered that SS Brigade Fuhrer Walter Schieber, Schieber excuse me, uh, never known to be part of Operation Paperclip, but he was. He was so close to Himmler. He was on Himmler's personal staff. And he wore, you can see that little button there, uh, that's actually the Golden Party badge. And that was given out by Hitler to his closest entourage. And he was a chemist, and he became very friendly with General Lukes, who I just showed you the photograph of. And the two men exchanged Christmas cards for many years, which are also in the military uh, Institute in Pennsylvania. Just to give you an idea of how close Schieber was to the top, these are photographs that the Bundes Archives does not let one reprint, but I'm happy to show them here. Um, there's Schieber with Speer and Milch. 
And there he is shaking hands with Hitler. So those are uh, General Lukes' diary. And I'm just going to sort of end here with just a little bit about reporting a story, which I think is interesting, I hope, um, about bringing new information to the table, because so much of this has been, you know, gradually written about in bits and pieces over the years. But when you come across something like these diaries, it's really incredible to me because I really do believe in the idea that more always gets revealed. And curiosity, you know, helps a journalist. And if you look and look and you're willing to keep looking, you will find. And these are Luke's journals. And in them, you know, here is this incredibly classified program, so classified, it's still classified. And yet, you have General Luke's, you know, that human in all of us that sort of wants to write in our journal, uh, you know, attended conference with Dr. Walter Schieber, classified matters. And it was from this kind of information, and it is from this kind of information that I am usually able to piece together the most interesting part of my stories. Because as a journalist, once you have a bit of information, you can go to the the powers that be that are telling you, no, 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 there is no information. And you can kick the door in a bit and discover these documents by filing different kinds of Freedom of Information Act requests based on facts that are known, and very importantly, dates, as you see in, in this journal. And from that, I was able to locate this document, which is pretty much the highest ranking um, war criminals that worked with uh, Hitler's nerve agent program. And that was the list of people that General Lukes would have at his home on Saturday afternoons as a roundtable discussion, and they would um, learn the secrets of the sarin gas program, which was then brought back to America and allowed the United States to build up its sarin gas program. And if anyone has been reading about Syria's chemical weapons programs today, we know that the ones that are being dismantled now are sarin gas weapons. So this is a long legacy. I was also able to work with some of the children of Hitler's inner circle um, by interviewing them in Berlin, very brave individuals who, you know, as they are getting older, 70s and 80s, most of the children are, you know, some of them were remarkably transparent with me and shared their parents' personal papers. And uh, that really allowed me to bring some interesting uh, things to the table that I don't think have been reported before, and also some photographs. This is Schieber, by the way. Um, and by 1952, he was working for the CIA. Some of the war criminals were sent to prison. This is Landsberg Prison, where they went. Some of them were hung. Those are the unmarked graves. They were able to pray in this lovely church. But ultimately, the Cold War was getting hot, and John McCloy, here with Truman, became U.S. High Commissioner of Germany, and, uh, and he gave clemency to the majority of the war criminals who were in Landsberg Prison, and they were released. And this here is Otto Ambrose at Nuremberg, He's the chemist, Hitler's favorite chemist with the one million Reichsmark bonus. Um, when he, w he was convicted of mass murder and slavery, he might have had some foresight, perhaps, which is why he's laughing that he would one day soon be released. But not only was he released, his finances were fully restored. This is the world's, what I would call, the, the CIA's first black site. Right after the war, the CIA, well, actually in 1947, after the CIA began, teamed up with naval intelligence, army intelligence, and air force intelligence at this place, and used some chemists and some chemistry that had been developed by the Nazis and began enhanced interrogation techniques using LSD and street drugs on what was now Soviet bloc prisoners because this was the Cold War. The two physicians at that facility, none other than Dr. Schreiber and Dr. Kurt Bloma. 
The reason that Bloma got the job was because Schreiber was sent to Texas. And Schreiber worked at the U.S. Air Force for the U.S. Air Force in Texas. And it's a long and tangled tale. You can read about it in the book, but it's really astonishing that Schreiber, the former Surgeon General of the Third Reich, was living in Texas. But as I said, the Cold War was heating up, and this was the threat. The threat was that the Soviets, who, by the way, had their own program of German scientists, um, they, ca they got a lot of rocket scientists, but unlike our program, we sort of put the German scientists up on pedestal, pedestals and treated them with great regard and made them sort of the top dogs of our program. The Soviets really loathed the Germans. There was deep animosity from the war, and so their German rocket scientists were kept at a second tier. And they were actually squeezed of the information and sent back to Germany by the Russians, at which point the CIA stepped in, grabbed up all those German scientists to try to learn what they could about the Soviets' missile program. But what they learned was nothing, because the Soviets didn't share with the German scientists that top tier of information. We moved forward with our biological weapons program. This is the eight ball. Dr. Blum consulted on this, and this is where we tested our bubonic plague weapon. Likewise, our sarin gas weapons. And Warner Von Braun became the head and the hero of the NASA space program. There he is with JFK. Arthur Rudolph, father of the Saturn rocket, I write at length about his story in um, Operation Paperclip. It's really just remarkable how he went from a guy without a, without a college education running the slave labor tunnels at Nordhausen to being father of the Saturn rocket in the United States. He was one of the very few paperclips who was actually investigated. And in the 80s, the Department of Justice got some information. It's funny that the Department of Justice would have to get information declassified, but they did. And they were able to see his complicity in war crimes in those, in those tunnels, and they gave him an option as an old man. He could either stand trial in the United States, this was in the mid-80s, or he could return to Germany. He chose to return to Germany. And lastly, and I think m most peculiar to me is um, Kurt Debus, who, you know, just those dueling scars alone make him look slightly sinister. But uh, many people regard Debus as an American hero and told me so. I found out a very different um, story researching his thick dossier, declassified now. Um, one of the myths of the German scientists was that they were just trying to do science and they were sort of skirting around trying to stay out of the eye of the, of the Nazi party who was this big bad wolf. But you find out um, in reading closely at the now declassified documents about Debus that he actually turned his superior, another scientist, over to the Gestapo during the war for making anti-Hitler remarks. And again, that remarkable push and pull. When I was reading these documents, you could see one part of army intelligence saying to the Pentagon, you know, we can't bring this guy to the United States. He was an ardent Nazi. He turned a colleague over to the Gestapo. This was a malicious, they use that word, this was a malicious act. But then you see the Pentagon saying, we need him. And he came. There he is as uh, the first director of the JFK Space Center. And every year, still, the National Space Club gives out the Kurt Davis Award. And when I recently interviewed the head of the Space Club, and I said, but what do you say when someone asks you, what about Kurt Davis? He wore the SS uniform to work. He turned over a colleague to the Gestapo. He was an ardent Nazi. What do you say to that? And the answer was, no one has ever asked me that question before. So I'd like to end with the idea that Einstein really had it right, in my opinion. He left Germany um, prior to Hitler's armaments build up, and he always maintained that the reason he left as a scientist was because he was not going to work for a raw and rabid 
Nazi militia. There he is getting his citizenship, and he's one of the few people with power that petitioned Truman not to have Operation Paperclip happen, but to no avail. And my last thought is this, which is written over the gate at Buchenwald, Yadem das Zeina, and it's an old German proverb that says, everyone gets what they deserve. And when I was reporting this book, and I was writing this book, I would often ask myself, does everyone really get what they deserve? And I hope that you, if you choose to read Operation Paperclip, come to your own conclusion. Thank you very much. So I have some time for some questions. Yes. In your research, uh, beyond the LSD stuff, did you come across anything about the techniques used to split per people's personality and MK Ultra? Did you find anything about that coming out of research that was started in the death camps? Well, I don't know about splitting personalities, but I do know that Camp King, that photograph that I showed you, excuse me, that is where the MK Ultra program began. It had two operational code names prior to MK Ultra. One was Operation Bluebird and one was Artichoke. And they began that scenario that I, that I spoke of during the presentation and I also write about in the book. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, two questions. Um, what were the theories why the nerve gas was never used? I know you said you had questions about yeah. it. What were the theories? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> to bring these people um, out, <clears throat> were any Vatican passports used? Mm. The first part of the question about uh, why chemical weapons weren't used, I would say the prevailing theory is that because when Hitler was a soldier in World War I, he missed the end of the war because he was gassed, and uh, mustard gas. And so allegedly he had a deep aversion to chemical weapons. But the Nazis produced tens of thousands of tons of nerve agent. So there were so many individuals under his command that really wanted to use those nerve agents. It really is nothing short of a miracle that it wasn't used. Your second question was? Um, in, in, with many of the Nazis, uh, Vatican passports were yes. used to mainly take to Argentina and then back to the States. And yeah. Well, unfortunately for Operation Paperclip, there was no need to do that because the, the Nazi scientists who came to America were given good old American visas and later uh, became U.S. citizens. Yes, in the back. Um, I, I have a real mixture of feelings. I'm both slightly nauseous and also very can't wait to get my hands on your book. Uh, I was actually living in Nordhausen when... Um, it was bombed uh, because of the B-2 operation. And uh, we left. My father was also one that worked for Banner from Brown. Wow. Um, and after the war in 1950, my mother was actually also a CIC agent before it became a CIA um, to identify Nazis before, as they were trying to leave the country. And, but my question was, uh, we left Munich in 1950 and we, you know, my father, my step, it was actually my stepfather, had stayed, gone back and forth to, to Geneva because he was one of the scientists that either Americans or Russians were vying for. Mm -hmm. And um, there are questions that I have. We left Germany in 1950, 51. He didn't take either of the offers. He decided to go to Damascus, Syria. Mm. Uh, instead with 10 other German rocket scientists who had worked with von Braun. And I've never quite understood. I was only 10 years old at the time. I never, uh, first of all, we left with non-German passports. We left with Arabic passports. My name was Violetta Issa. <laughs> and every time the conductors came in to check passports, I had to look out the window. I wasn't, my mother said, don't talk. Um, so my question has always been, you know, um, there's so much that I don't know because as a child, 
you know, you just sort of live with it. An American ambassador uh, actually helped us leave Damascus. My father came to America with us. We came together when there was a coup in 1953 in Syria. And he wound up working for Lockheed. He became the head of the missile test program in the Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz Mountains. One of the other scientists, Rudy Beichel, worked in Sacramento and worked for Aerojet for 40 years and was very instrumental in, in developing the Beichel cycle. It's so fascinating. Maybe you can stay afterwards and, and speak with me. I'd love to. And did you have a question? Well, I wanted to know about how did the other German scientists, how did so many of them who did leave, you know, how did they actually... Why did they use Arabic passport? Uh, and why did they not? Was it because there were Nazis? They Come were, talk to me afterwards. The, the, the Middle Eastern connection is very interesting, and it's not part of Operation Paperclip per se, but we can chat after. Right. Thank you very much. Yes. Did you find in your research at all about Plum Island, New York, mm -hmm. and what happened there around genetically mm -hmm. modified mm -hmm. organisms, Lyme disease, mm -hmm. that whole thing? Did you? General Lukes, who became very friendly with the um, chemists, was in charge of setting up Plum Island. And Eric Traub, who was worked under Dr. Blom, uh, was in charge of the weaponizing Rinderpest and also Tularemia for the Reich. And Traub is often connected with Plum Island he came to the United States, he worked for um, the Navy, he worked for the Department of Agriculture, and there's a lot of suggestion that he also set up Plum Island and worked there, but I could find no official documents that made that connection sound. But it certainly is reasonable speculation. Good question, yes. Yeah. You know, during the 1960s, 66, 67, there were people in this country who were trying to confront the Justice Department to say we had a lot of Nazi war criminals here, and why don't you find them and either put them on trial or deport them to jurisdictions where they should be put on trial and dealt with. And the Justice Department always said, we don't have any Nazi war criminals in this country. And besides, you people who are asking the questions are leftists and communists, and we're not interested in what you have to say. But they did have an office in the 1960s to, to address the issues of whether people were Nazi war criminals. They just couldn't find any. I'm wondering, did you come across any research yes, like it's, that? Yes, it's a great point you bring up, and twofold answer. One, um, a number of individuals in the State Department, because the State Department was an important part of Operation Paperclip on this end, because the State Department was the organization that had to give those visas. And there was a couple individuals, one in particular named Samuel Klaus, who was outraged by this program. But he was very quickly accused of being a communist, and he was moved out of the State Department. The reason why, to answer the second part of your question, the reason why Arthur Rudolph was ultimately investigated by the Justice Department was that, you know, lo and behold, throughout the 60s and 70s and early 80s, different organization groups, often Jewish organizations, would sort of muckrack, so to speak, and get, try and get the Justice Department to look into this. And ultimately, they did, and a special unit was created only in 1980 that looked at these war criminals. Yes. Did the Nazi scientists who were brought here, how did they justify the work that they were doing? They were supposedly working for mankind, not killing it, as a scientist. And did they show any remorse for what had been done? It's a great question. Um, the first part is n no. There was n there. Remember that there was most. There was not even a sliver of accountability on the part of the scientists. They always denied that they were part of it. I mean, Dr. Bloma, although he originally started to talk to the um, military officers about what went on, very quickly it became what they did, not me. And that was always the position. Always, always, always. And as far as remorse is concerned, there was only one 
Nazi physician out of all of the scientists that I looked at um, who showed any remorse. And that was a doctor named Dr. Fritz Fischer. And during the Nuremberg trials, after he heard a particularly gruesome bit of testimony by some survivors, um, he turned to the one of the intelligence officers, Dr. Leopold Alexander, who's really one of the heroes of the book, and he said, just hang me now. But that was it. it right here, yes. Uh, two quickies, or I'll say them quick, it can take as long as you want. Uh, first is, another notorious person from World War II who was involved with experiments, and obviously not part or any of his people, part of Paperclip was Mengele. Mm -hmm. And even now there are moral issues that are at stake about using the information that he garnered mm -hmm. from some of his experiments. Is your book touching that at all? Mengele I actually write about in my Area 51 book, but not in Paperclip. I did not come across any other information about him. As far as we know, he, he, you know, he was in Germany for a while and then he went to South America. But the, the question that you raise about the uh, information used is extremely important. And what I will tell you is that there's a, there's a two-part U.S. Air Force physiology manual, which is very difficult to get your hands on, um, that actually used data from the concentration camps. And you see the credits and the footnotes go to those doctors that I showed you the photograph of that were hauled off to Nuremberg, one of whom, Dr. Hermann Becker Freising, was actually sending notes to Dr. Strughold for that U.S. Uh, Air Force manual from his prison cell at Landsberg Prison. Leaving the responsibility of the Nazis who he brought over and coming to the Americans who made it happen, let's go to the top. Is there anything you found about Truman's awareness, approval, or anything else? Oh, well, Truman approved the program. Um, I'm sorry if I left that out, and here we are on President's Day. Um, <laughs> you know, the uh, Operation Paperclip was a classified military program, right. but it had a benign public face. So... The Joint Chiefs knew that if you started having, you know, upwards of 1,600 German scientists running around, somebody was going to catch on to the fact that this was going on. And so they propagated this myth that these were benign scientists. 